Hey everyone, Constantine here, and I know what you're thinking. Holy crap, she actually still does these things, these film review things, and yes I do. Part of the reason why it's taken me such a long time to put up this review about Hutta Kitty is because uh, I knew that people were going to jump all over me because I'm going to be talking about the subject of Bushido and people tend to get, for some reason, really sensitive when you talk about uh, any sort of interpretation of this subject. So part of me was wary of all the weird comments I would get about it. But another reason is because I filmed this before and it ends up being extremely long and I was hoping I could find a way to film it so that it wouldn't be so long, but unfortunately it's just going to have to be long, so this will probably be two parts. Uh, that said, this review is going to be about Harakiri, or Seppuku, if you want to go by the Japanese name, which is a 1964 film by Kobayashi Masaki. It is a critique of feudalism and authoritarian power, and it is one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, I've recently been asked uh, quite a bit about what my favorite movies are, and uh, this is a question that I'm not really sure how to answer because I watch a lot of movies and I'm not really quite sure how, especially how to compare how good a movie is to another movie if they're outside of the same genre. Uh, but after some deliberation I've decided that really a movie only needs to meet one criteria for me to be, to place it on my list of best films. And that is uh, if there is nothing about the film that I would change or that I think could be changed to make it better, then I'll put it on my list. So in other words, if I think the film is perfect, just the way it is, then it's going to go on my list of favorite films. And uh, so far, the only other film that's actually met this criteria that I've reviewed on this YouTube channel is Mike Takashi's film Audition. So now I'm officially adding Kobayashi Masaki's film Harakiri to the list. Harakiri is basically a revenge story that is set in the early years of the Edo period. And as you can expect from a Kobayashi film and a Jidaigeki uh, made in the 60s, Harakiri uh, is a critique of feudalism and authoritarian power. Uh, this film was released in 1964, which is not too long after Japan's defeat in World War II and some of the harshest years of authoritarian rule ever experienced by Japan, the island country. Uh, so during the 1950s and the 1960s, movies set in the Edo period often contained criticism of Imperial Japan's wartime legacy and Japan's legacy of authoritarian power in general. Uh, basically, the strict feudal atmosphere of the Tokugawa period really ended up being a very useful metaphor for a critique of more modern authoritarianism. And as a director, Kobayashi was perhaps the most critical of uh, imperialism, feudalism, and authoritarian power. Nearly all of his films contain some form of criticism on the subject. Uh, included in the Criterion Collection's release of Harakiri is both a critical essay and an interview of Kobayashi conducted by Joan Mellon. Uh, if you're more interested in reading about her interpretation of the film as a critique of authoritarianism, I suggest you buy the DVD or you go to the Criterion Collection's website and read the essay there. Uh, personally, I'm not particularly interested in regurgitating what Joan Mellon has already covered. She's done a better job of it than me. So instead, I want to compare and contrast the different depictions of Bushido uh, found within the film. And I have also posted an essay on this topic on my blog, so if you're interested in reading it, please follow the link in the sidebar. So as I mentioned before, Harakiri is set during the beginning of the Edo period. The Tokugawa Bakufu had completely established its power over Japan, and the country is going to enjoy its longest period of peaceful rule, uh, about 250 years. However, peace, obviously, did not mean good things for the samurai, who had earned their living by being warriors for centuries. So though they will try to preserve the martial traditions upon which their social class were built, the samurai will be gradually transformed from warriors into bureaucrats during the Edo period. 
Uh, Harakiri is set in 1630, so it's very early in the period, so it's really before this transformation has fully taken place. However, the Yi clan's preoccupation with preserving their reputation for martial valor clearly alludes to this transformation. Uh, a little bit about the plot. Nakadai Tatsuya plays a ronin named Sugumo Hanchiro, who has fallen into poverty after the disgrace of his clan. Uh, for reasons never explicitly stated in the film, Sugumo's daimyo commits seppuku to atone for uh, some disgrace, and the clan is disbanded. Sugumo's closest friend also commits suicide, um, and Sugumo likely would have also committed seppuku if it weren't for the fact that his friend, before his death, requested that Sugumo raise his son for him. Uh, Japan was full of ronin during this period, uh, you know, in part due to the military defeat of clans that had opposed the Tokugawa during the Battle of Sekigahara, but also because samurai didn't have much, they were, there wasn't much of a use for them anymore, and so the daimyo kept the samurai they had, but after a while it became difficult for samurai to find jobs and to find work. And so you see instances of samurai sharing the same job with another samurai. Uh, so they really became bureaucrats. There wasn't much of a use for them anymore. And because of this, it became nearly impossible for Sugumo to find a new position under a new lord. And so years later in the film, he has decided to eke out a living making parasols and performing other odd jobs. Uh, as a member of the samurai class, he could not pursue occupations such as farming or laboring without giving up his social position as a samurai, and you have people like Toyotomi Hideyoshi to thank for that. Uh, so Kobayashi really makes it clear from the start of the film that Tsugumo is a compassionate man. He won't abandon his principles, uh, he won't give up being a samurai, but he also is very loyal to his family, even if it means he has to live in poverty to do so. There's a scene in the movie where Tsugumo refuses to marry his daughter off to a somewhat wealthy samurai lord because she would have been sort of like his concubine, and Tsugumo wasn't willing to let his daughter do that, even if it meant that he could have gotten a new position as a samurai. So even though Tsugumo's life is hard, he draws happiness from watching his daughter and the son of his friend grow up, and they fall in love and eventually get married. However, of course, things have to go from bad to worse, and Tsugumo's daughter and his grandson uh, are soon struck by an illness. And both Tsugumo and his son-in-law, Chijiwa Motome, uh, are basically at their wit's end when it comes to figuring out how to uh, pay for the bills for the doctor and support their family. So finally, at his wit's end, Chijiwa Motome knocks on the door of the Ii clan and requests permission to commit seppuku in their court. Um, he's obviously not really interested in actually killing himself, but Shijiwa was hoping that his request would be denied and that they would give him a small gift of money sort of as compensation for their refusal. Uh, the Ii clan, however, is aware that this has become a popular tactic uh, by, of the ronin to try and gain a position within the samurai clan or to get a bit of money as compensation and they are quite frankly unwilling to let their reputation be damaged by a sign of weakness like that. Instead, the Ii clan decides to grant Chijiwa's request, and realizing that he has made a very severe miscalculation, Chijiwa attempts to gain a few days of respite before the ceremony to say goodbye to his family. Obviously, a clan obsessed with a superficial pursuit of martial valor is not going to grant this request, and they force him to commit suicide or seppuku that day. Uh, even more cruelly, however, the Ii clan discovers that Chijiwa has sold his blades, the blades of his sword, uh, to a pawn shop, obviously to get money for his family, and the blades have been replaced by bamboo. Uh, but of course the sword is supposed to be a representation of the soul of the samurai, so the Ii clan forces Chijiwa to commit seppuku with his own sword. Uh, the scene depicting Chijiwa's suicide with the bamboo sword is one of the best scenes in any movie I've ever seen. Uh, back in 1964, when the movie was shown at the Cannes Film Festival, members of the audience actually fainted because of this scene. And now, even though it's more than 40 years old, it is still extremely graphic and difficult to watch, uh, in part thanks to Kobayashi's excellent directing, 
and also due to the fantastic acting by Ishihama Akira, who plays Chijiwa Motome.